Hello and welcome back to this damn full idealistic crusade. This video is a book review of the Bold Venture Press reprint of Johnston McCauley stories. It's actually a five part story. So it's published across five different pulp magazines. And this collection is entitled Tubway Tam uh, meets the Crimson Clown. And the spelling of one of the characters names is in reference to his iconic lisp. And most of the titles of the Tubway Tam stories are usually at least usually feature some sort of uh, amusing spelling as is found in the various stories about the character. So it's always difficult to know exactly how to pronounce said character's name and I'm not used to it so I'm trying to get my, my tongue around it so that's why it's still a little bit weird for me to even say the character's name out loud because I don't know what the correct pronunciation technically is. But it is essentially Subway Sam meets the Crimson Clown. Now these two are just two of the many classic hero or other characters that uh, came out of the mind of Johnston McCulley, most famous for the creation and writing of all of the iconic Zorro stories, which Bold Venture has reprinted in the six-volume uh, Zorro reprint series, which I've already reviewed on this channel. Uh, they've also done uh, the standalone uh, printing of Ghost Bullet Range, which is a standalone uh, McCulley Western pulp novel, and I hope they do more of, of McCulley's writing because there's, there's so much that has never been reprinted or collected and outside of uh, the works that are turning up on uh, public domain sites or Project Gutenberg or in uh, various anthologies and collections, it's just these from Bold Venture and then some from uh, Altus and Steger books where, where you're getting at least some of the incredible literary output of Johnston McCulley actually collected and anthologized and available. Uh, so there are some collections of of the various Macaulay hero characters, and it's also uh, interesting to note that he created so many different heroes and characters that certain ones lasted for a while, some all lasted on and off for a great number of decades, like Zorro, uh, some lasted for a significant period of time, and then seemingly he just moved on to other things. So if you were to collect or look for all the stories of all the different characters, you'll find that some only have a few, some have a good amount, some like the Crimson Clown have have a, a quite a good number of them, and then others like, uh, well, well Tubway Tam essentially is... I think just about the longest running character that uh, Macaulay wrote on and off. He's, he's right there with Zorro because there are uh, dozens and dozens of Tubway Tam stories. But the last Tubway Tam story was actually published in 1960. So this is a character that lasted on and off from about 1918 to 1960. So obviously Macaulay had fondness for the little guy and so does the reader as well uh, once, once you read one of these stories. But uh, even at this point in time, it's very uncommon to have two major characters that were very popular have essentially a team up or a crossover story so this obviously predates comics by a great degree and uh, most of what macaulay did in his adventure stories and and all the various uh, fiction that he wrote uh, does prefigure a lot of what you see in comics and i do think for many reasons macaulay is one of the most important american writers of the 20th century certainly uh at, at the top of the heap just about in the in the realm of pulp literature, but he helped to create or uh, finalize or, or, or he basically laid a lot of the foundation for many different genres, but particularly uh, for hero fiction, adventure stories, westerns, and again, many other genres. So when you read a Macaulay story, you'll recognize certain elements that seem familiar to you already because you've seen them done so many times that, that uh, it's, it's basically become part of, of pop culture and just uh, some, some things might be even considered cliches because uh, they've been done so many times. And reading this story in particular and anything with these two characters, you will recognize plenty of elements that have been uh, lifted and then done to death by things since. And this is actually a quite developed story because, again, it was published in five parts in five different magazines. So it's a bit lengthier than your typical standalone pulp adventure story uh, about one of the characters. And you've got to have more page count because you've got the two of them meeting. Now, 
it's not necessarily what you might call a full-on team-up in the sort of uh, comic book parlance. It's it's more of a crossover, and I mean, they, they do sort of team up a little bit, but it's just really notable for 1928 especially to have two major popular characters by the same author actually having a crossover story that ran across five different magazine issues. Now, a little bit of background about the two characters. Uh, we'll start with Tubway Tam again. Sure, essentially, Subway Sam is a, a endearing pickpocket who works the subways, who uh, is always one step ahead of the police and the particular detective out to nab him. And the reason why his name is Tubway Tam is, of course, he speaks with a de- with a very definite lisp, and so uh, all the dialogue constantly has. Uh, particular uh, spellings to highlight his 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 speech patterns and while it does take a little getting used to in terms of having to sort of train yourself to to read these stories to understand all the lines of dialogue it's it's uh, relatively obvious what what he's meaning and he never lets his lisp get in the way of his his doings and it does not really set him back in any way but he's also rather interestingly a essentially a thief with a heart of gold uh, who is known for being honorable and only essentially robbing those who could afford to be robbed and uh, always being polite and uh, you know essentially if you ask him a direct direct question he's not going to lie to you so he has a certain honorable standing and he has constant back and forth uh, discussions with detective craddock who is his essentially it's not really his arch nemesis because they sort of have a an understanding relationship and and uh, a, a, a attraction to one another and they both like the other but they can't admit it so it's one of those scenarios and they're they're constantly trying to one up each other and uh, Tam has tried to go straight many times and just tries to struggle along and make ends meet and is a very endearing character and you very quickly get used to the speech patterns and while again there might be one or two spots where you have to reread a line because the spelling kind of throws you a little bit uh, there's there's something about the character's spirit that just wins you over and that's something you find with pretty much all of of macaulay's heroes the crimson clown on the other hand is actually in reality a rich playboy named denton prowse who as the crimson clown uh, essentially robs from other thieves and criminals and always gives basically half of whatever he gets to charity and that's that's his way of fighting back against crime in one sense also enriching himself and finding the uh, thrill of adventure and danger that he needs in life and he also is somewhat dressed like a clown which is why why he's known as the crimson clown he also rather interestingly is it, it's it's almost a cross between your uh, well, what would be later traditional uh, costumed vigilantes, of course, Batman being the most famous, but of course in the pulp world, the spider as well, of a rich playboy with a secret costumed identity, and of course the Zorro parallels are right there. But you've also got the sort of gentleman thief aspect, which is much more of what you see in Leslie Charteris' The Saint, uh, and the idea of giving back to charity gives this character a bit of a Robin Hood flavor as well. So there's actually many different aspects to this character, which are quite fascinating, but he can also be ruthless, and he also is extraordinarily intelligent, which is how he keeps two steps ahead of both the police and the entire criminal underworld, and his main antagonist of source is Detective Donler of the police, who is always searching for the Crimson Clown and never can na- and never can quite nab him, and is always uh, chatting away about the, the trouble of trying to capture the Crimson Clown, who's too smart, with his uh, great friend, society playboy, Denton Prowse. So you have that classic sort of dynamic there, where the hero is actually talking to the police detective and 
getting all the information they need to always stay out of the way <laughs> or throw them off the scent because, of course, uh, the police will never know that they are the person who they're searching for. Tubway Tim is merely a pickpocket, but the Crimson Clown is a vigilante thief, and he does carry a gun. He does get into action and fisticuffs and things, but also he usually carries some form of hypodermic syringe, which he uses to either incapacitate or uh, hit enemies with a sort of true serum, or uh, the, the one I found most amusing is that when he goes to, to turn people over to the police or leave them for the police to find them, uh, he injects people with a serum that not only makes them fall unconscious for a period, but when they come to, they speak gobbledygook for hours. So there's there's a bit of inventiveness there, and it is, is very clear that this character is not trying to um, to to kill anyone. So it's it's not necessarily having a no-kill rule, but it's a, it's a fascinating aspect of this particular character. And from what I understand, this would develop over time into uh, different methods. So I think eventually he had a sort of gas gun that he carried in the later stories instead of having like a, a pocket full of hypodermics to, to jab people's wrists with but it actually works uh surprisingly well and it's something you don't necessarily expect from a pulp story from 1928 for a hero character you would expect it just to be a a gun and and knocking people out and that's it now the plot that brings our two characters together is actually quite simple in, in terms of the the overall setup there is a a fantastic world famous jewel collection that has recently been stolen and one day the crimson clown as denton prowls gets a letter in the mail saying that someone knows his identity as the crimson clown and threatens to expose him if he does not uh, actually go after the people uh, thought to have stolen the jewels and at least obtain the primary jewel, which is a gigantic ruby, and get, uh, send it back to the owners. Uh, if the Crimson Clown will do this, uh, the mysterious uh, writer of said letter will not expose his identity and allow the Crimson Clown to also keep any of the other jewels as a sort of means of payment. And it's a sort of almost sort of a gentleman's agreement type letter of, uh, of with a, an amusing degree of politeness. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have the tone of blackmail, but uh, we don't know who this who this character is, of course. And this sets the Crimson Clown on the path of the rest of the novel, the main plot of trying to recover the stolen jewels so his identity isn't exposed. But he's also going up against a formidable gang, which is the gang of Baron Blood, now there's a villain name. <laughs> it's fantastic. And of course, uh, uh, Macaulay spells it with, with a U in terms of blood, but still, it's the villain is Baron Blood. What's not to love? Uh, but Baron Blood's gang is basically known as the, the most notorious gang of, of jewel thieves, and, and no one's ever been able to pin anything on them. So he, uh, the Baron always hides among high society and aspires towards the high life. And perhaps the only person the police want to nail more than the Baron Blood gang is, of course, the mysterious criminal and clown. So it, it's a, a formidable task, and the Crimson Clown knows that he will need some sort of assistance. So uh, after doing some investigating uh, while donning various disguises and other identities, again, something you would see Batman do frequently, the Clown decides to enlist the aid of Tabway Tam under various means, and then eventually just appears before him one night in the clown costume and gets Tam to join along. And it, it does take some doing because both of these characters are essentially lone wolf operators. They don't work with other people. And so there is some mutual mistrust that is actually amusingly drawn out and and well done. And then once that's done and over with, there's a sort of interesting working dynamic between the two uh, who don't actually see that much of each other after this point. So Tabway Tam is recruited to essentially uh, lift uh, Baron Blood's wallet, which contains particular documents that will help the Crimson Clown find the jewels. But of course, things get complicated and go from there. So I don't want to spoil any more of the plot, but that's the basic setup of these two characters, the, uh, the actual plot of this story and how they are brought together. Now, because this was originally done across five different uh, magazines, it is 
actually, I think, lengthy enough to feel fully satisfying because uh, most pulp magazine stories are the length of a, an average short story or a novella when they're longer or two or three parts. Uh, so y- when you have two characters, if you were just doing one story, one is probably going to get shortchanged somehow. So since this was a five-part story and both characters were already established enough, I think you get enough with both in, in terms of time spent uh, for someone like me who's not read one of these characters' stories before. It's it's a really enjoyable read, and you get enough of both characters that the story feels satisfying. For those who have never read a Johnston McCauley story before, McCauley's prose is so, um, I would describe it as very open and understandable, but also incredibly engaging. Uh, McCauley's stories, anybody can pick up and read, and you know exactly where you are, and you can't put them down. They're so enjoyable that, I mean, you could read this book in one sitting, and I pretty much did because it was that enjoyable, and the chapters did have some nice sort of cliffhangers, and I just can't get enough of of McCulley's writing. Uh, And of course, being a lifelong Zorro fan, finally getting to read the Zorro stories and seeing how beautiful his prose was and, and his storytelling abilities, it made sense why the character was immortal from his conception. And then going to some of McCulley's other writings and finding that same beautiful sense of storytelling and adventure and beautiful and easily understandable prose style, uh, it, it just it's irresistible. So I would recommend this book to anyone, whether you're a comics fan or a fan of Macaulay's other work or a Zorro fan or you like classical hero adventure stories from the pulp era. Uh, Honestly, anyone will enjoy reading this. And what's really fascinating is that you have two characters being brought together in a crossover in 1928, and these two characters seem... Well, they seem quite outlandish because you have a guy who's essentially sort of disguising himself as a clown committing robberies (laughs) and injecting people with true serums and things because he has a basically like a part of his costume filled with hypodermic needles. And then the other guy is a pickpocket who works the subways with a really thick lisp. You wouldn't think that either one would be... Uh, a, a character you could hang a whole story around because they have certain outlandish elements and it just it, it seems like an odd fit but both characters are incredibly well drawn and engaging and fascinating and it makes sense why they lasted for some time so it's nice to see them interact with each other and now I really want to go read all the other Crimson Clown and Tubway Tam stories uh, just hopefully I can figure out if I'm pronouncing Tubway Tam correctly <laughs> it's still hard to get my tongue around so that's that's the one thing with the Tam stories is you, you do have to get used to reading the, the particular spellings out and sometimes thinking through some of the lines of dialogue to realize oh well he's actually saying this it's i guess it's sort of like a little bit of an anagram in that way you have to sort of decode the the actual words sometimes and again it's it, what what makes the character work is that he's a thief with a heart of gold and yes he has this really bad list but he it does not affect him at all and it, it doesn't bother other people they don't they don't make fun of it or or make fun of his inability to form complete sentences sometimes so it's just something that he lives with and that makes the character feel more human and three-dimensional now in terms of the bold venture reprinting they have made this really lovely, very attractive uh, trade paperback. It's got the nice sort of oversized uh, dimensions. There's a nice sort of gloss on the cover. We have usage of original pulp artwork put into a new layout. As you can see, it's actually relatively thick because this is actually 200 pages. So it is rather lengthy, but it reads beautifully. The rear cover is really well done. I do like how we once again have pulp artwork. We have a little description of each of the main characters and that this is a crossover. And then nicely, there's an image and information about Macaulay himself, which they always do on their paperback reprints. Then on the inside, rather nicely, we do have some interesting design. Some of the pages have black backgrounds like the title page. There's also a new forward for this release which talks about the characters and their publication history and this particular uh, five volume story arc as well. The text layout is like the other Bold Venture reprints. Really nice on the eyes. Very easy to read. Nice font size as well. 
And it's also nicely laid out, so there's not a lot of dead margin space or something. So even though this is a bigger book in terms of dimensions, uh, Bold Venture has nicely laid the text out, so it's very easy to read. And if that were not enough, once we get to the end of the book on page 200, there is actually a gallery of the artwork from the pulp magazines that these were originally published in. So we have one of the covers, but really nicely, they have reproduced the internal illustrations, which of course were black and white to begin with, but it's really nice that we get these because it's not often that you get the pulp art, the interior illustrations on a lot of pulp reprints, and while I would have preferred them being in the actual stories as they would have been originally, um, I'm certainly happy to have them here, which again, it's, it's not often that we get these in a lot of these sort of standalone less expensive uh, pulp reprints. So it's basically five images, so I assume it's one from each of the individual magazines, and I believe this would be all of them, but uh, it's just nice we have them here. And then there's a little bit of information on Macaulay and an ad for the Zorro collection reprints. And like most Bold Venture uh, books, this is, of course, print on demand, but it's nicely done. Um, there are no major typos or spelling issues, which is great. And you really have to worry about that with a Tubway Tam story because you have to specifically make sure all of his dialogue comes through with the particular odd spellings. And, you know, if, if you had spell check, it would absolutely hate a Tam story because every every line of dialogue he has will be you know flagged like crazy so that was really great to see that there were no uh, typos or spelling errors uh, this is really affordable its list price is $14.95 but it's frequently on sale um, you can get it at Bold Ventures website but they also sell their print on demand books through Amazon and this is dipped below $10 and you know, even at the list price, it's a great value because the, the, these have never been reprinted before. It's a great story arc. And again, it's 200 pages that you won't be able to put down because it's so ridiculously enjoyable. But uh, when it uh, goes down under $10, at, at the time of this recording, I think the uh, from Bolt Venture getting it through Amazon, I think it's down to about 7 or $8. So at, at that price, it's a no-brainer. And I hope they uh, get to keep doing more Macaulay stories because every Macaulay story I've read has been an absolute delight and Tubway Tam meets the Crimson Clown is no exception and it's really notable for it being a an ex a very early example of, of a crossover between two hero or other major characters. So those are my thoughts on the Bold Venture Press reprint of, or I should say collection, of Tubway Tam meets the Crimson Clown, the five-story arc crossover between two of Johnson McCauley's most notable characters outside of Zorro from the Pulp Magazine era. This is a really well done reprint. It's very affordable. The paperback is really lovely, but you can also get this as an ebook, which of course will be far less expensive. So if you want to go that route, uh, Bold Venture does have an ebook version as well. So in either case, this is a really fantastic story. It's so much fun and so well written that I, I pretty much read it in one sitting because you can't put it down uh, as, as with all of the great Macaulay stories and reading Macaulay's work from from the pulp era really shows how he was one of the most influential writers who helped to build a lot of the genres that we take for granted nowadays. And I, I, I do think he's one of the most important American writers of the 20th century, without question, but it, he doesn't get the credit for it, as most of the other pulp writers I would put in that category. But uh, they, they certainly deserve it, and, and Macaulay does need to be recognized, not just for Zorro, but all of his other works outside of Zorro, and that's why I'm really thankful that uh, Bold Venture and Altus and others have been reprinting some of the stories of the various characters and collections and anthologies, and then one-offs like this when you have a whole multi-volume story arc with two of them being united for the first and only time. So as always, I hope you've enjoyed my babblings about uh, classic pulp fiction, classic hero characters, the world of Johnson McCulley, and pulp reprint publishers. As always, please do keep supporting both both independent bookstores and independent publishers by buying directly from them wherever possible to support them directly and help keep them in business. Uh, and as always, keep reading, keep reading print books, and thank you ever so much for watching.